Greetings all. Here we go with this week's video on sonnets, Shakespearean sonnets to be specific. The man was a beast. He wrote 154 of these. They have their own Shakespearean way of doing a sonnet. There are different ways and his follows a particular format. At the, the foundation of it is the iambic pentameter. I can't meet, read my writing and Google that real quick. Now, iambic is the adjective form of, get rid of the last syllable, and you have I am. And that is a foot in poetry, a foot of poetry in poetry is like a beat in music. So the I am is an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. It would be like ta da. You accent that second syllable. Unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable is one I am. All right, so what you want to do is try to find a word that is an iambic foot. Let's look at Shakespeare, for example. Here we have two syllables. Which one is stressed? If it's an iamb, it would be the second one, Shakespeare. But now we don't say it that way. We say Shakespeare. So that's actually what you call a troche. It's a different foot. But the stress is right here on the first syllable. So Shakespeare doesn't work. How about this word, begin? Separate it, you got the two syllables, begin. You hear how I say that? Begin. Ta-da, begin. You hear how that second syllable is stressed? That is an I am then, all right? Now, Shakespearean sonnets, they're based on the iamb, and within each line is the pentameter. So if you look at penta, a pentagram is a type of star that has how many arms or how many points? Five. So there are five feet in a line of poetry that is in pentameter. Five beats, kind of, we'll say, in music, right? Now, string five iams together. It would be like ta-da, 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 ta-da. Five iambic feet in one line. So make notes on your Google slide where I laid it out for you. Get that down as we then move to the first poem in our sonnet study. This is sonnet number 123. No time thou shalt not boast that I do change. Thy pyramids built up with newer might to me are nothing novel, nothing strange. They are but dressings from a former sight. Our dates are brief, and therefore we admire what thou dost foist upon us that is old, and rather make them born to our desire and think that we before have heard them told. Thy registers and thee I both defy, not wondering at the present nor the past, for thy records and what we see doth lie, made more or less by thy continual haste. This I do vow, and this shall ever be. I will be true, despite thy scythe and thee. I think I might have mispronounced this word, that than. We'll get back to that, though. All right, so first thing up, you have the first quatrain. So right there, you can tell a quatrain is how many lines long? Four lines. And now let's look at rhyme scheme. Remember, that's the last word of each line. And what is, how does the, how do they rhyme? And what we have here is an ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme. Notice change rhymes with what word? Strange. And might rhymes with what word? Sight. So there you have the A and B 
and A's, because they have the same rhyme, and then you have B, B. So we call that A, B, A, B. So what is the poet saying, though, and to whom? Whom is he talking to? Think metaphorically here. And what is the poet saying? Well, he's talking to time, personifying time, and he's claiming that time does not change him. You know, as we grow, we want to think, oh yeah, we change, but the poet here is saying, nope, it's not the case. What is his evidence? What evidence does he use? Grand structures, like we have pyramids. So the old structures and new are just reiterations of the same idea. It's like a car model. Each model will have its own name, Ford Focus. Over the years, it evolves, yet it's still really just a reiteration of the same idea. And that's what he's saying here. He is still who he has always been, even if his outer appearance may change a little bit. Then we go on to the second quatrain here. And, okay, what's the rhyme scheme now? So do we have A again, which that was the sound change. No, we have admire. Admire. So that's a whole different vowel sound. So that's going to be another letter. We've used A and B, and admire doesn't rhyme with might or strange, or any of those. So this becomes C, D, C, D. So notice how this thing lays itself out. Admire, desire. Those are the C sounds. Old, no rhyming words before it. So that's a new sound as well as told. So that becomes D. So we got C, D, C, D here. All right, paraphrase the first independent clause. What is the first independent clause? Remember, subject and a verb combo that can stand on its own. It's a complete thought. Let me help you here a little bit. Our dates, our brief. It's the first kind of main uh, complete idea in a way. And what does that mean? Our, our dates, our brief. Life short. Right? We're here. We're on this planet, which is billions of years old. We're here for just maybe a hundred if we live right and are and are lucky. Right? Life is short, it's tiny compared to comparatively. How does this impact our perception of objects then, according to his his uh, this quatrain right here? Our dates are brief, and therefore we admire what thou dost foist upon us that is old. So we look at things that are old and we think, whoa. These things are incredible. Why are they? do they seem so incredible to us? Because we are such a short lifespan, right? And then we think they're kind of unique and original. We don't realize that what seems new has occurred before. We make them born to our desire, like we've thought them up ourselves, or what we think is brand new and not having been done before. Then he moves on to our next Quatrain. Here we go. So this next one. What's the rhyme scheme here? Do we have any rhyming words that existed before? Does defy rhyme with any words before? Nope. This is going to be E, E, Lie. Now here you got past in haste. Technically it's F, F, 400 years ago. Past and hest. You know, it could be accents here. But now they don't rhyme so much the way we speak, but back then they probably did. And then what does he mean here when he says, thy registers? Remember, who's the thy here? Well, we're still talking about this guy right here, time. And he says, thy registers and thee I both defy. What do you think he means about that? How do we, do we register our existence? Yeah, sure we do. We have certificates of birth and death. Um, everything's documented in a way. Think of all the ways our lives are registered and chronicled and in writing and whatnot. But notice, he says, he defies both. What do you do when you defy an order or you go against it? You, he's, not, he's not caving into them. When he says in the, the line here, for the records... And what they see doth lie. And here he's meaning telling a lie. They lie. Made more or less by thy continual haste. So what is it they're lying about? They suggest beginning and an end to one's existence. Yeah, this... 
I suppose officially or consciously, we come into being and we go out of being as perceived by others. But what he's saying is that our sense of being perhaps never ends in a way, existentially speaking. And I think that's what he's getting at here with this. On paper, I'm born and I die. But in reality, there is no beginning or end. And this is now called a couplet, as you probably know, right? What's the rhyme scheme? B and D, brand new. So we got to go to the next letter on the alphabet. You guessed it, G, G. And this structure, he follows all the way. With every poem he does, it's that. And I kind of love it that way. It forces you to think analytically, structurally, while developing a universal abstract theme on being, as he does here. And what does he say in the end? I will be true. You've seen the images of the Grim Reaper comes around with a scythe, cutting people down. Think about a scythe is used to harvest wheat, cutting the stalk, thus killing it. Does its function and purpose end at that point? No. Once it dies as a plant, it becomes food and thus functions beyond its own death. And I think what he's saying here is, yeah, you may cut my body down, but my truth, my existence will go on despite my being cut down and by time doing away with this physical body. And think about it nowadays. Life is short, but the truth of this life is eternal, it goes on and on and on. You know, and in a practical sense, this is yet to be borne out, but think about it, social media, right? Does our existence not continue on through these platforms after we die? Remember, more human than human and the one programmer or coder gets hit by a car and so his friend develops an algorithm to make it seem like he's still texting from beyond the grave. In a way, the truth of the guy still exists in the mind of his friend in spite of the fact that he is now dead and gone. Do we create virtual realities of ourselves, truly of ourselves, that continue on beyond the corporal body's existence. Before we move away from Sonnet 123, I didn't address the iambic pentameter, how it lays out in the poem. And you'll notice when I read it, I paid no attention to that because it makes it sound goofy and sing-songy. But the guy is true to his iambic pentameter here. So now I will stress that and you'll see how that sounds. No time thou shalt not boast that I do change. So, no time thou shalt not boast that I do change. See, the words, he uses words and a syntax that fits into that iambic pattern. Listen to the second one. Thy pyramids built up with newer might. To me are nothing novel, nothing strange. They are but dressings of a former sight. So the way he, his syntax works, they come in right on the appropriate beat or foot. To me are nothing novel, nothing strange. So that's how your iambic pentameter works. And if you went throughout the whole thing, you could find stresses that are naturally flowing. They don't sound weird. But I don't read it that way because you want to read these to understand what he is saying, not for the rhythm and music of it. But it's good to know that he does stay true to the format. Number three. Look in thy glass and tell the face thou viewest. Now is the time that face should form another whose fresh repair, if now thou not renewest, thou dost beguile the world, unbless some mother. For where is she so fair, whose uneared womb disdains the tillage of thy husbandry? Or who is he so fond, will be the tomb of his self-love to stop posterity? Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime, 
so thou, through windows of thine age, shalt see, despite of wrinkles, this thy golden time. But if thou live remembered not to be, die single, and thine image dies with thee. Okay, now let's take a look at what this one has to say. So we go with the first quatrain, as always, and by now you'll know the rhyme scheme is ABAB. Looking at, and I'll just use one color, viewest, new, renewest, another mother. <laughs> and I'm not going to go back through that. You, you can look back at the first one to get rhyme scheme and such. But let's take a look at some vocabulary. Glass is mere, as it says here, beguile means to deprive. So what is the poet claiming in this first quatrain? About the glass deprive that the subject, the person whom he's talking to, <laughs> should reproduce, have kids. Um, and why? What's the reason <clears throat> that he uses right in here? Thou dost beguile the world. You'll, humanity will be at a loss from, for the absence of his offspring. This must be one incredible friend he's got here. But we go into the second quatrain. Remember always, rhyme scheme's going to be what? C, D, C, D, right? New words, womb, tomb, rhyme with nothing over there, husbandry, posterity, nothing in front. So what do we got going on here? Uh, and how are tomb and posterity used in this stanza? Tomb, of course, metaphorically, right? To be the tomb. Who is he so fond to be the tomb of his self-love to stop posterity? Pause this, look up posterity, see if you can come up with an interpretation yourself. But we can take tomb, like I said, as a metaphor for burying his beauty by not having any kids. You know, he can't pass it on genetically. Thus, and, and if it's like, what is his reason for not having any kids? He says his self-love here. Maybe it's if you, the person doesn't want to go through the trouble of raising children. I don't know. Or it's not fitting in his lifestyle. Either way, it's kind of the poet is claiming the guy. I think he looks at it as more as a vain kind of um, motivation here. But denying future generations out of his own vanity for some whatever his motivation for not having kids. Our next quatrain, we, third one, and of course you know the rhyme scheme by now, EFEF, -E rhyme scheme. Remember, by the way, uh, the iambic pentameter, right? So if I take this first line right here, thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee. Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee. He's still following that iambic pentameter, right? So how does the poet compare one generation to the next in here? Notice, he's the glass means mirror, right? So he's saying that this person to whom he's speaking is his mother's mirror. In other words, he can see his mother in himself. If he can empathize with her, he will then look back on his time now he will see that this is his beautiful time. His mom was beautiful when younger as well. And he must see that right now before he gets old. And then we go to the final quatrain with the main theme, the main meaning of the whole piece. And which does the couplet express? Positive punishment, because he's saying basically there is a negative consequence after an undesired behavior is exhibited. Here, the undesired behavior is not having kids. What's the negative consequence? His image or all that he represents, you know, could he be on your physical beauty, perhaps, but at the very least, his physical beauty is gone and not regenerated with a new generation. And there you have number three. And let's move on to 130. 
My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Okay, let's analyze 130 now. So we look at the first stanza as we've been doing. And by now, I don't even have to go over a rhyme scheme, iambic pentameter. You know how those go. Notice the poet compares his mistress to various objects in here. Uh, what do we have? What comparison do we have? Well, her eyes compared to the sun, coral, to her lips, snow, to breasts, hair, to wires. <laughs> Lots of comparison. Now notice that. So what is he getting at here? And I think what we have is he's poking fun at like love poems that go way overboard. You are so incredible. You are like, you know, I mean, literally, eyes nothing, uh, compared to the sun. Come on, please. No one's eyes are that way. And he's kind of making fun of the the um, construct or, uh, at the time of these over-the-top poems praising the beauty of this and that person. And so that's what we're going to get throughout this whole thing. And eyes are nothing. Uh, corals far more um, done. Uh, black wires grow on her head, right? Pretty ridiculous. And that's his point. Hey, what about sensory details? Oh, notice. Sense and touch. It's really cool, the visuals. And this goes back to where I'm from. Uh, she used a lot of sensory details, so he does that here, too, throughout. So let's pay attention to those as we go to the next quatrain. And upon which two sentence, senses does this quatrain focus? Describe the comparisons made here. So uh, we've got roses, red and white, uh, perfumes, a mistress, <laughs> the breath reeks, and I think you can tell, yeah, smell and visual. I would say there's visuals there too, but a lot of smell. And I love how he does that, <laughs> the couplet there with, and in some perfumes, is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks? <laughs> As morning breath, we all got it. If we move on to the next quatrain and explain how the poet uses sound and touch as comparisons to define his mistress. So here, basically, though her words please the poet, the sound of it, the sound of them, they're not idealistically pretty. And as far as how she moves... Uh, she doesn't float like a goddess. No, she's a human being. She treads on the ground just like we all do. So the first three stanzas, uh, or, or quatrains here, it seems like he's insulting her almost. Compares not at all, she doesn't. But that's the satire of this whole thing. She does that, and how does he point out the satire of it? Well, by the couplet, the final couplet here, where he, he refutes all of the three quatrains. And how does he do that? He expresses how he loves her. Uh, his love is for her is rare because she is an individual. She's a beautiful human being in his eyes. And even though she doesn't match up to the ridiculous metaphorical comparisons throughout, she's a beautiful person to him.
And that's truth. And I love that final couplet because up to that point, if you don't get his parodying the the over-the-top love poems, you think, what, a, what an insulting punk. But the final couplet reveals the truth. And with that, we will proceed to our final sonnet, Study 27. Sonnet 27. Sonnet 27. Weary. Sonnet 27. Weary of toil, I haste me to my bed, the dear repose for limbs with travel tired. But then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's works expired. For then my thoughts from far where I abide intend a zealous pilgrimage to thee and keep my drooping eyelids open wide looking on darkness which the blind do see. Save that my soul's imaginary sight presents thy shadow to my sightless view, which, like a jewel hung in ghastly night, makes black night beauteous and her old face new. Lo, thus by day my limbs, by night my mind, for thee and for myself no quiet find. Ever had one of those nights where you wake up at 3 a.m. and just can't get back to sleep because something's on your mind? Well, if this is any consolation, humans have been doing it for centuries, so we are not alone. So here we go on Sonnet 27 in our first quatrain. Poets both tired and active. How so? How is he both tired and active? Well, as we look, physically tired from work, right? Weary from toil. Toil, working, physical toil. That's what makes him go to bed. And his limbs, those are the things that are really tired from traveling, doing whatever he's had to do. Yet, once he gets in bed, then he's got a journey in his head. And that's where the mind just starts going. His mind will not let him sleep. So what is it that he's focused upon? Well, before we do that, what do you think? Is this a spatial or abstract journey? And then from my thoughts, from f- then and for then my thoughts from far where I abide intend a zealous pilgrimage to thee. Pilgrimage, of course, as we know, is like a journey, right? So is this physical, spatial, or is it abstract? And, of course, he's in bed, and it's his thoughts which are going far from where he abides, which is in bed, right? So we know that indeed it is a it is an abstract journey that he's talking about here. It's in his head. So what is the journey about? He's imagining going to meet someone, right? I'm going to zealous pilgrimage to thee, to you, heading to you. And it's keeping his eyes open. He can't he can't keep them closed. And he's only looking on darkness which the blind do see. But it, so he doesn't see anything yet, right? But it's his eyes are open. His eyes are open, and then it's the visualizing this person whom he's thinking of, um, where thy shadow to my sightless view presents thy shadow to my sightless view. So how is he using that? Save that my soul's imaginary sight presents thy shadow to my sightless view. So I think what he's seeing is either the memory, well, it could memory, it could be yesterday, you know, he just, he's on a journey, maybe he had to leave someone, or it could be from a long time ago. But he is now visualizing this person, and the image in his mind he calls a shadow because it's insubstantial, it's 
It's a figment of his imagination. He can't touch it like shadows, right? But then the shadow, the image itself that's in his mind, it actually takes form in the night, making black night beauteous. But I'm thinking this right here is referring to the night, personifying the night. That changed my... Yeah, I said not sure. And that's the way it is with these things. You know, you do them for years, and then it's like, what the heck's he getting at? But notice, everything's in second-person point of view. From the, my body's work, Zell's drooping to thee, which we would say you, right? So he's talking directly to the person, thy, your, shadow. But then he changes to third person right here with the her. And for a while, for a long time, when I looked at this, is it someone else uh, he's got? But then he thinks of you, the person to whom he's speaking. No, I think it refers back to Black Knight and her old face new. In other words, he right now visualizes the person whom he wants to see, and that even turns the darkest night into something beautiful, something new than what it is normally. I think that's what that is, so I'm going to get rid of this. Yeah, I'm... I'm I, I don't know if I'm positive, but I think it's enough. I can, based on the evidence in the poem, I can do that interpretation. I think it would work. I suppose if someone talked to him, poet might have had something else in mind. But at this point, literally and figuratively, the poet is dead. Therefore, I'm going to interact with this text, how my mind wants to interact with it. And as long as I can back up my interpretation with evidence from the text, it can stand. So let's go on to the final couplet here. And what does he say here? Explain how the poet uses quiet, both literally and figuratively, in the final couplet. Lo, thus by day my limbs, by night my mind, for thee and for myself no quiet find. So literally, why is there no quiet? Well, I would say one, because he's up in the middle of the night. He's, he himself is making physical noise, and the earth, the world around him is. You'd hear stuff. But then, figuratively, his brain is, is completely full of the images of this person, and therefore will not let him slip into slumber, into sleep. And so, hopefully he doesn't have to get up early to morning and can sleep in and get his seven hours at least. You guys, though, you should be getting 9 to 10, I guess. So do your best. Get some sleep. Try to quiet that mind at night. Remember, contact me through Gmail. Keep your eye on the website. We'll be going on Springboard and Classroom because now your sonnet is coming up next. So stay tuned for directions on how we're going to do that. See you next time.